Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Obstructive sleep apnea, also known as OSA, it's a serious and even life-threatening condition. And the risks of untreated sleep apnea include heart attack, stroke, irregular heartbeat, and high blood pressure. None of those are good. No. And the National, the National Sleep Foundation estimates that 18 million adults have sleep apnea, and it probably affects 2 to 3% of children as well. Kids snoring is so cute, though, isn't it? I know, but mm. I didn't know they had sleep apnea. <laughs> <laughs> when first... Uh, when first line options for treatment, wearing a CPAP machine or an oral appliance are ineffective, surgery to treat obstructive sleep apnea might be a possibility. Here to discuss surgical options for sleep apnea is Division Chair of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery at Mayo Clinic, Dr. Bur- Dr. Christopher Biazzi. Did I say that right, Dr. Biazzi? Absolutely. Okay, Thank good. You. Did, you, did you say maxillofacial right? Maxillofacial. Maxillofacial. Do that You're two for two. Okay, maxillofacial. <laughs> Dr. Biazzi, nice to have you on the program. Thanks you. Thanks for having me back. So tell us about this problem, sleep apnea. It seems like we hear about it all the time. It's very much in the lay press right now. It's huge. Uh, and you talked about 18 million people. That's probably a very low estimate. Really? Today, I mean, with the increase in obesity rates uh, in, in this country, it's, it's thought that it may be as high as 30 million, maybe 1 in 10. Uh, so the prevalence has gone up dramatically uh, over the last uh, 15 to 20 years in particular. Before we get to surgery, though, there are other things that people can try before surgery is the next option. What are some of those quickly? I mean, you probably know lots of people that are on CPAP, the breathing machine. Um, and for most folks, it, it works well, and it is the gold standard treatment, and it should be. Uh, but there are other non-surgical options, things like position therapy, where you put a tennis ball in your, in your shirt and so you don't lay on your back. Um, a, a dentist can make uh, an appliance, for instance. You talked about that earlier. There are even some medical management medications that can be used in, to treat this disease under the supervision of a sleep doctor. Let's go back a second. W- what actually is this? What happens? What's wrong? Well, for whatever reason, either a structural problem of the airway from a lack of proper bony development or perhaps a, a, an excess of soft tissue or fat, the airway uh, at night will collapse. So when you're particularly lying on your back and you, uh, you're relaxed and you're sleeping well, unfortunately your tongue and your soft palatal tissues can uh, go backwards and obstruct the airway. So it's uh, an obstruction of the airway. Something is blocking the airway so you're not breathing properly when you're sleeping. Yeah, and this can happen you know, 100 times an hour for some patients with severe disease. And when you stop breathing like that, all kinds of bad things happen. You talked about blood pressure issues. You can have heart disease, rhythm disturbances, strokes, all kinds of problems. So you try those options to get rid of sleep apnea or at least to lessen its severity. Uh, surgery is then where you get, uh, it gets better bad enough that you need surgery. Yeah, a small percentage of patients will cross over into what we call surgical treatment. Most people are well served to not have surgery and we want to avoid those kinds of things because they're they're risky. All surgery carries risk. And let's talk about uh, <coughs> some of the options. And uh, are these patients that have virtually all tried some form of medical management that failed? They actually have to, uh, and from a variety of perspectives. Uh, no surgeon should be operating on patients who, unless they've failed medical management, number one. And today the insurance companies are very careful about making sure that people have had a good, robust trial of non-surgical therapy before you go on into surgical care. So if they fail, let's uh, CPAP. And then the, they're sent to you? Well, they're sent to somebody. Oftentimes a, an ENT physician and an oral, an oral and maxillofacial surgeon are probably the two most common uh, providers that are, are seeing these patients for consideration of surgery. Uh, here at Mayo Clinic, for instance, oftentimes both, both groups will see. Um, our ENT physicians frequently will do soft tissue surgeries. Um, in our specialty, we tend to do bony surgeries. And it all depends on where the problem is and what the structural abnormality really is. So we try to give it a sort of a, a specific approach to each patient based on their own unique anatomy. You said soft tissue versus bone. Explain the difference there. Well, in some patients, they may have very normal facial bony growth and development. And the problem is that there's an excess of soft tissues. Either they're heavy or perhaps not, but for whatever reason, the bones are normal, but the soft tissues cause collapse. 
There's another set of patients. Too much stuff in there. Too much Blocks stuff the in there. Yeah. Blocks the area. Too, and, and obesity is, and obesity, is a big that, issue. That's, yeah. that's typically the issue I mean, with obese if you patients. Have, if you're obese, you're obese everywhere. Right, exactly, okay. including in the pharyngeal uh, airway space. That's the throat. Exactly. Uh, the other side of the coin is the person who has some for, form of bony abnormality in terms of facial growth and development. And in that case, the soft tissues may be very normal, but they're not in a normal location. And so that's what tends to lead to collapse. And that's where bony surgery can put those tissues into a better position and prevent obstruction at night. Bony surgery? Bony (laughs) surgery. It just doesn't sound good. Tell us what you do there, uh, gently. Again, there's a lot of different procedures that can be uh, uh, used. There are many operations that are done for for people. Some of you, your your listeners may know somebody who had an underbite or an overbite or a Jay Leno kind of chin. And those kinds of operations are often done to correct bite problems or facial skeletal deformities. And, and similar things can be done to treat sleep apnea by moving those bones forward and therefore pulling those soft tissues up and out of the airway. How successful is a surgery like that? It's, it's actually very successful. The, the surgery to move the facial bones forward has about a 90% cure rate. Hmm which is actually a lot higher than the soft tissue operations uh, in general. But there are all kinds of new things coming all the time. There's another procedure out right now called hypoglossal nerve stimulation. Hypoglossal nerve stimulation is a procedure where you um, uh, implant a, a stimulator, much like a pacemaker, that causes the tongue to be protruded just a small amount at night each time you take a breath in. Mm -hmm. And so that relieves some of the soft tissue obstruction and can be a better option for people who have a soft tissue problem rather than a bony problem. So that's another surgical uh, option that's out there for some folks. Can you briefly describe for us how you move part of the face forward? It's a very careful process, uh, (laughs) Dr. Shives. uh, We... um, some people will say, well, you're going to break my jaws and move them forward. There's no breaking. There's a lot of controlled cutting of bones and, and making careful cuts in the bone and moving <laughs> things forward and then holding things together with little tiny plates and screws until your body can heal things. All right. That's enough. That's yeah, enough. That's good for me. <laughs> controlled is, cutting. Controlled yeah. cutting. <laughs> what uh, is the distraction that you were talking about when we got going? Explain that to me. Distraction osteogenesis is a big fancy term. And what it means is that you grow bone by slowly lengthening a cut oh. in the bone. And actually, it was developed by orthopedic surgeons in Russia, as a matter of fact. Elizarov was That's the guy. not surprising, is it? Yes, not at all. <laughs> and I thought we'd want to give a shout out to orthopedics while Always. we're here today. Thank you. Uh, but in any event, this was uh, developed initially for lengthening uh, long bones, uh, legs, arms, I believe, in congenital short stature patients. And we use it in the facial region now quite a bit, particularly in our cleft lip and palate kids. And it can also be used in sleep patients sometimes. <laughs> Finally, uh, this is the 100th anniversary of the Dental and Oral Surgery Program uh, Division at Mayo Clinic. It is. Exciting. It is exciting. Um, We have a tremendously long history here in dentistry and in oral surgery, partnering with our physician colleagues. The Mayo brothers knew that there was a connection between oral disease and systemic disease. They were pioneers in that area. And we've been privileged to participate in the care of patients uh, here with our medical colleagues since that time. So it's very exciting, and it goes back farther than any place I'm really aware of. I have to imagine it's changed. Everything has changed a lot, not just your practice, but Mayo's practice in 100 years. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's always evolving, um, and and, uh, it's such a great place to be for that evolution to occur. All right. Congratulations on the first 100 years. We've been talking about surgery for sleep apnea with the Division Chair of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery at Mayo Clinic, Dr. Christopher Biazzi. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. My pleasure.